So, Berto, I have some questions for you and me to answer, and I thought we would read those questions and then answer them on the air for everyone to hear our answers. What do you say, Berto? That sounds like a super plan. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I manufacture real fake dolls. I want to learn how to say your name the way you say your name, Umberto. Umberto. Oh, that was really good. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Gold. I mean, when I say my name, I, I go like, Umberto. Okay. <laughs> I do the same. I go, Kirk. Kirk <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, anonymous listener says, what is up with conspiracy theorists? Specifically, all the conspiracy theorists coming out and saying things like the pandemic is not real, it is a conspiracy of Bill Gates to vaccinate the world, and other infuriating theories. In my opinion, it is very narcissistic to think that you know more than the experts do, and also very narcissistic to think that you know exactly what is going on in the world based on speculation and very little evidence. Do you agree? What is up with that? Berto, what do you think? Yeah, man, there has been a trend for uh, how long now? Uh, an anti-intellectualism trend. And it's really disturbing. It's very disquieting. I, I don't like it. Nope, sir. I don't like it. Um, basically, there's this sense that like, if you're a physicist, a scientist, uh, uh, you know, like you have an agenda and you're just using that science stuff and I have a, I, I wonder if something, I, I just had this idea yesterday. You know how when you're in school and you're little, there's all this pressure on you to perform and get A's and you have to like take the test and then, oh, you have to study for the test and then you're graded and evaluated and how smart you are. I wonder if we're traumatizing a ton of people because, you know, a lot of people, like there's, there's a curve and a lot of people are average smarts and maybe... It's hard. Maybe school is hard and maybe they end up being a little traumatized. And so later in life, they go to resent that because maybe they felt like they underperformed. And instead of, of you know, them being told like, hey, it's okay. Like, it's, you don't have to get A's and everything. You don't have to be a genius at math. You don't have to be all these things. They then like resent it. And so then a lot of people are like, yeah, I don't trust those educated types because like they read all them books and they do all those math equations. When in reality, it's like, well, yeah, but they don't know the first thing about whatever you do because you've spent your time doing uh, specializing in other things. And we need the things you do as well. Um, I, I mean, I felt this way. I have felt super appreciative that there are so many people that are good at things I'm not good at. And they're not good at the things I'm at, good at. For example, you know, when I've recently, because of this situation, had to become a little handier around my house. And I'm not handy by default. Do you know what I did the other day, Kirk? Do you know what I did? Wait, are you talking about being handsy or being handy? <laughs> Both. Okay, listen to me. My screen door had been busted for months, meaning the screen had like basically come off. Yeah. I had bought the replacement screen mesh, but I was waiting to pay someone to fix it for me. And then this happened, and then I was stuck, and then I was like, well, it's okay, it's still cold. And then it started getting warmer, and I'm like, dude, I need a screen door. I had to get down on my hands and knees. And after I was done with that, I had to get down on my knees to fix the screen door. And I had to like push this little rubber thing in with a screwdriver, and it took forever, and it was really hard. And I know, wow, cry me a river. But the point is, I had to get handy. And I appreciate that I'm not good at that stuff, other people are. I appreciate that. I don't know the first thing about farming. Other people do and so forth and on. And so, I, but I, I feel like, yeah, there, there's a lot of folks out there that look at science and uh, engineering and biology and all these things as like sort of a mystery that they resent. And so, yeah, vaccines fall in that bucket and people telling them that the virus spreads in this way or that way fall in that bucket. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I, I think that that could be absolutely true. I I obviously would need to see research on that. But it makes sense that, as I always say, the average IQ is 100, which is, uh, for some people, you might be surprised at how low the average IQ is, <laughs> you know? Like we tend, yeah. whatever sort of IQ you have and the people around you, you, 
you might tend to think, well, that we're, we're average, or I'm a little bit above average or something. I've tested Umberto's IQ, and I'm here to say he's in the 99.9 percentile, literally. And thus, his intelligence, your intelligence, Umberto, is Please like... stop it? It's like th <laughs> two or three standard deviations. Okay. And so for every Umberto, there's someone that's far below. And, f you know, so the, the point is, is that the average person has an intelligence that is far below you, Berto, which means that it's harder for them to understand things. Um, and so... Uh, I, think, I think you bring this up frequently so that you can set me up for failure. Because then now everyone assumes I'm like smart and then they're, they're gonna constantly be testing me and I'm gonna be constantly failing the world. Well, so what I'll also <laughs> say along those lines is that being having high intelligence does not mean you're immune to conspiracy theories. There's a lot of people that uh, are educated and intelligent and also believe in what you and I would characterize as a ridiculous conspiracy theory. So right. being intelligent doesn't necessarily mean that. But I could see a certain route to some of the uh, odd belief systems that some people have that we would deem as odd that other people would not. That when they were going to school, they were uh, they're traumatized in some way by the fact that it was hard for them to, un to comprehend the physical sciences and then they just sort of develop this attitude about that field and maybe people who adhere to those fields. I could certainly see that. But um, the general uh, philosophy or conceptualization in my field and social sciences around why these kinds of phenomenon exist in society and they've always existed and they exist in all societies. These conspiracy theories like Bill Gates is just trying to, you know, ruin everyone through his vaccines. Um, is because when we have uncertainty, we have fear. And right now, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear. And when we have fear, we get desperate for security. We get desperate for some kind of answer, some kind of way of making ourselves feel safe. And when we have a situation that lends itself to safety, then we will quickly resolve that. Like, if I am driving my car and suddenly I'm made aware of the fact that a lot of people die on the road, for example, from drunk driving or accidents. Well, there's a pretty easy solution to that for me anyway, which is drive defensively, uh, follow the speed limit, make sure you, you understand what's going around you. I feel in control. So I don't have to look any further than my own driving ability to make myself feel secure in the face of uncertainty and fear. When it comes to the kinds of things like the coronavirus and uh, the uncertainty about that, we're talking about global uncertainty about who's gonna die, who's not gonna die, who's gonna get infected, who's not, um, the economy, all these kinds of things. There's no easy answer. None of us, you or I, Umberto included, have any safe place to go to in our minds about like, okay, here's what I'm going to do about this over the next 10 years of my life. Like no one knows what's going to happen. No one knows how to deal with this. And, and there's no, and any expert who proposes anything will say, well, we just don't really know yet is what they'll say. And so in the face of that desperation for security and lack of any kind of answer to that security, then that's when belief in conspiracy is convenient to our egos because it does provide a secure, safe answer to a very insecure situation. You know, JFK being shot is a scary situation for a lot of people that any president or any public figure or anyone could just be assassinated out of the blue. And the and there's all these details to it, like the notion that one man who just decides that he's going to kill our president could just decide, I'm going to kill the president, and then succeed at that. That's, that's a very insecure uh, place to be in, that one person could just ruin our lives and you know the lives of our government um, right. because he just decided to do that. That's a very scary situation. And it's easier to believe, it's, it, it is more comforting in a weird way for some people to believe that it was a mass conspiracy, that in order for a president to be offed, there has to be a conglomeration of many people conspiring together to, 
to kill our president. It couldn't possibly be just the will of one man. It, that, that's, that's a scary situation to be in. And so when it comes to the coronavirus right now, I'm guessing that for some people, given the amount of uncertainty and the amount of fear, it's easier to just say, Bill Gates is trying to kill us. Well, that would seem to make one feel insecure. But for some people, that makes them relax because, well, now we know who to fight. It's Bill Gates. We just have to get rid of vaccines and we have to get rid of Bill Gates. And that will solve my problems. That is easier to swallow than the vast sea of uncertainty that is the reality of our situation. That's a main reason why people go to conspiracy. Now, for some people, you know, so all of us are experiencing that uncertainty. What makes a difference between those who go to those simple answers and those who don't? Me and Umberto do not go to those answers. Other people do. What's the difference between me and Umberto and those other people? Well, some people are more prone to conspiracy thinking, and they've done a lot of research on this. I don't have it in front of me, but off the top of my head, there are certain uh, personality traits related to various different things that result in some people having uh, what we call conspiracy mindedness, I think is what they call it. But if you have magical thinking, it can be sort of immature. If you have black and white thinking, if you're anti-authority, if authority has wronged you in the past, if you've been conspired against by someone in your life, and you just have this template that like the world is generally conspiratorial and, and you know, harmful to you behind the scenes, then obviously that will inform your uh, vulnerability to conspiracy thinking. And also it cannot be ignored that there are certain echo chambers where these conspiracy theories aren't conspiracy theories, they are fact to these people. And when you are fed just story after story after story and no, and any kind of opposition to this is not fed into your echo chamber, it is really hard not to adopt those belief systems. We have people right now that are essentially being brainwashed by the internet and by Facebook and by you know cer certain news, news outlets that are stating things as fact and have data to back up their claims. And if you had no opposing force, then of course you're gonna adopt those points of view. There's just no way out of it. And most people do not understand that they're in an echo chamber. Uh, everyone is in an echo chamber. So I'm in an echo chamber. And so I am always questioning things that are being fed to me through my echo chamber. In fact, one of the things that I've been doing lately with the people protesting on the streets, saying that they want the government to open up our economy again, I've been going to people who are talking about that in their echo chamber and hearing from them. Because in my echo, echo chamber, all those protesters are being painted as complete idiots or zealot religious people or something. And of course, one could characterize some of those people as that, but I have found that it's a, it's a much more pluralistic movement, if you will. And there's a lot of different notions that are not being fed to me in my echo chamber. Now, do I agree with them? You know, I, I'm not gonna go into that, but uh, I'm just saying that the echo chamber that some of these conspiracy theorists are uh, are the people who ad adhere to conspiracy theories, the echo chamber that they're in is bizarrely different than the echo chamber you're in. And so when you look at them, you're like, that is bizarre thinking. Well, it's because their echo chamber is a bizarre echo chamber and there's there's almost no way for them not to have those points of view. Berto, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to think that the whole conspiracy thing that that we're experiencing was started by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, there there's there's a lot of um, you know misinformation that is used by intelligence agencies. So uh, there's long long standing ideas that many of the things that rumors that circulate sometimes are planted to dissuade people from looking into other rumors. But that said. Um, yeah, I, I, it's what you say about echo chambers, uh, echo echo chambers, um, is true. It, it's 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 of course every every one of us uh, gravitates towards those opinions and people who already support us or who we sound more sound more simpatico to our positions and things like that. Uh, no question. However, um, there is something different. Like 
in the current situation because usually what happens, well, it, the closest analog actually is the anti-vaccine movements, right? Because that one does put us at real physical risk. Maybe not as immediate, but it definitely is there. And so I was thinking about how, well, okay, yeah, like if, if the anti-vaccination movement kept spreading, sure, they, they, many of them don't mean well, uh, poorly. Like, you know, I remember in 2000, I don't know, 2010 or something, I remember I was looking into this too and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Why are they putting all these ingredients in these vaccines? And what, this one dude does say that it seems to be like it could be causing autism. And I remember looking into it. And so I could see how people would start, you know, and then they care about their children. So they're, they're afraid of doing something that will harm them. I totally get that, right? But clearly, if that spread and more and more people start doing it, well, we'd have an even worse problem in our hands because all of a sudden we got smallpox back and we got like every number of crazy disease back. That would be disastrous. We'd be over. Um, so this one, I feel it's like that, except in the current moment, it's, it's, uh, it's even more insidious because we are talking about that in any, in any pocket of the population, this thing could spread pretty quickly. And uh, yes, it's not going to kill everyone, but the ones that it harms, it's going to do a ton of harm to. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And the forces, seemingly, there's evidence of astroturfing, meaning that there are people, is that what they call it? Astroturfing? Yeah, you, that's when they when like you rally like someone's pushing from behind the scenes to like get people out and yeah, I mean and I, I think they call it that because like the astroturf on the stadiums and like so you're like getting people out to the stadium for the protest or whatever it is. Well, for the political rally. My assumption, maybe that is it, but my assumption was that astroturfing is fake grassroots because it's it's trying oh. to make <laughs> something look grassroots. Okay, that you're is right. <laughs> actually not grassroots. Okay, that that makes a lot more sense. I always pictured. It's so funny. I always picture like they hold these rallies probably at stadiums and the stadiums have AstroTurf. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yours, yours makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, who knows? But the uh, motivation is obviously there to the rich people who can get the health care and also protect themselves by having, you know, boats on the ocean where they don't have any contact with any other people. There's a ton of incentive for these people to use their money to try to get the economy going again because their stocks are suffering so greatly. And also certain political figures who depend, they think, on the economy doing well in order to be reelected. And so there's a ton of money being poured in to these organizations. Now, it's free speech. They can put their money into protests. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But as a society, we have to look at that critically and say, okay, uh, Part of this, you know, quote unquote grassroots movement is potentially motivated by people who don't care about the American worker. They only care about their their portfolio and their wealth. And we're not talking about the wealth that they need to survive. We're talking about like a tremendous amount of extra wealth that they don't even need because they just yeah. are obsessed with having billions of dollars in their name so that they can throw their weight around and have more power or whatever it is that they're weirdly focusing on. So that that's another uh, part of this that, um, you know, is, is, a, is a force. Now, I don't know how much of that is there, and I think that my echo chamber tends to overemphasize that aspect and not uh, emphasize the fact that there are a lot of people who are really suffering right now economically, meaning that they can't work or they lost their job or they're worried about paying their mortgage next month, and they want the freedom, as they say, to go back to work. And that's a valid concern. Um, now, what to do about that is, is a larger public health question that our government needs to think straight about. And I have very little confidence in our governments to, to think straight about that, but, you know, that there you go. But, you know, anyway, so let's take a break and we get back. Let's talk about Dr. Drew. What do you say, Berto? Yep, let's do it. All right, we're back from the break, Umberto. So if Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla were to ask the non-patrons to become patrons, what would that conversation sound like? Well, the thing you've got to really be aware of is 
Um, there are things you should and should not do when you're having a conversation with someone you are trying to resolve some conflict. Hey, listen, listen, listen. I don't want any of this BS. Like, you just tell them what you're feeling. And like, if they're feeling they want to become patrons, you just tell them, like, become freaking patrons. Well, I, I hear you, Adam, but like, there are more subtlety. Ah, now give me your subtlety BS. I'm sick and tired of you. I'm, that's it. I'm going on my own. Well, I don't think you'll make it very far. That was spot on. That was amazing. I felt like I was back in 1997. <laughs> so anonymous listener asks, what is your opinion of Dr. Drew? He wrote a book called The Mirror Effect. Have you read it? Uh, no, I have not. The whole premise of the book is examining celebrity narcissism like reality TV and how narcissistic behaviors get displayed in the media and then get replicated or mirrored in the viewers. And eventually these narcissistic behaviors get normalized. What mm. do you think of that, Berto? Oh, wow. Um, so about that concept, that sounds intriguing. I, I certainly haven't seen the research, but uh, that sounds intriguing and somewhat believable, meaning especially with the younger viewers, I know that a lot of my thinking was modeled after the media that I consumed throughout my life, especially when I was younger. So I wouldn't be shocked to find out that if um, younger people are watching a lot of these celebrities and reality shows and all these things, that they would start like uh, taking on some of those patterns for themselves. I would believe it. Um, about Dr. Drew specifically, however, when I was younger and I listened to Loveline, I had a lot of respect for the guy. He was the voice of reason. And, you know, I didn't know much about what they were talking about technically, but what they were saying seemed reasonable. And then I liked Adam Carolla. He seemed to be the every man's voice. I have mentally modeled myself in that regard when it comes to this podcast. Uh, I will say, though, I, I've been very disappointed by Dr. Drew in the, in the subsequent years and somewhat disappointed by Adam. Uh, with Dr. Drew, most recently, um, he egregiously went on these rants about how the whole problem about coronavirus was just the media and that it was all being exaggerated and all these things. And it was just like shocking to what extent he did that. But even, even before that, I had started noticing that I didn't like his approach anymore. I remember in some episodes where they were still doing uh, callers and there would be these these gals. I remember this gal called in and she had a high-pitched voice. And then his thing was like, anyone with a high-pitched voice was abused. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe not. But the point is she calls in and she's saying something. And he's like, yep, I mean, you were abused, right? And it was like something like that. And it was such lack of tact. And it was, and then, and then he got really confront. He would start getting really confrontational with the callers. Uh, and I get that he had seen and heard it all so many times that he was like, look, 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 I've seen the pattern before. You're not fooling anyone. But I started getting really a bad vibe about it. Like, man, you're you're letting this go to your head. You're forgetting that empathy that I thought you had when I first started listening to you. So I, I for a long time now, I've been I've been splitsville with with his uh, approach. Yeah, I agree completely. You and I have talked about this before. I don't know if it was on the podcast, but yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. I also have modeled myself after Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla, but it was all from the, I remember I, every night I would listen to him and I would listen to Loveline on the radio in 1997-ish. I would go for a walk, often late at night, like at midnight around Green Lake. I, I lived just a few blocks from Green Lake uh, in North Seattle. And I had a portable radio, like a Walkman kind of thing. And I would listen to them as I walked around the lake and I just really liked them. And I was a young therapist at the time and uh, I really looked up to Dr. Drew and there was a lot of really wonderful moments. Adam was more humble back then. Dr. Drew was more, they were both more humble back then. Yeah. And they both really listened to people who called in and, um, you know, there were good moments, bad moments, but I, I really respect them. I haven't listened back to those times, but I suspect if I did, I would see a lot of good in, in what they were doing. But then they get more famous. There's a lot more uh, encouragement for them to be more sensational in what they're saying because they their trade is to get more views. You know, because in the beginning, my impression was they consider themselves to be this tiny little radio show that was in Los Angeles that very few people were going to listen to, right? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Drew still had his practice back then, and Adam Carolla wasn't rolling in money, and so there wasn't this 
this like privilege of their opinion, if that makes any sense, that had mm -hmm. developed. And, and over time, Dr. Drew has become an entertainer. He is, he's been a reality TV show person. He goes on com comedy podcasts and doesn't even talk about anything medical. And so we've seen him change over time. The same thing happened to Tom Likas. You know, you and I have talked oh, about yeah. this. Uh, <laughs> when I first heard Tom Likas on the radio in the early 90s, I experienced him as, as just, a, just a regular radio guy who didn't have anything strange to say. Over time, he morphed into this complete d douchebag. Uh, he is the definition of a radio douchebag uh, by the <laughs> by the late '90s, where it was all boobs and beer and you know toxic masculinity. And which, which we've talked about this. Like that's the only time. That's when I started listening to him was the late '90s, and so I just assumed that was his entire shtick. And right. I got to be honest, I liked it because I was like in my early 20s, and so I was like, yeah, this is fun. Yeah. And then there was Dr. Laura Schlesinger, whom was actually nice. kind of a motivation for me to become a therapist because I loved her radio show in the early 90s and really looked up to her. But then I sort of lost touch with her. And then in the like 10 years later, I, I heard that she was still on the radio and she was she had a lot of bad press because she was just saying some ridiculous things that were very unusual and I, f and I found to be not in line with the way I thought Dr. Laura Schlesinger was in the beginning. And I, so with Dr. Drew, I saw that same drift f from a humble, caring, slow, non-sensational uh, clinician who is just trying to help people who call in, trying to make the world a better place, to someone who it seems so thirsty. This is just me looking at it from the outside, but that just seems so thirsty for clicks that will sort of divorce themselves from their credibility and their integrity and become more like cranky old men, if that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's disappointing. Uh, so I, I, you know, I've certainly seen that. And I, uh, you and I have talked about this before too, that as Loveline even progressed, they would develop these heuristics where, like you said, a, a woman would call in and would have a high pitched voice and they would be like, who abused you? Who sexually abused you? Right. One, that's stupid. Plenty of people have high pitched voice, voices for reasons other than being sexually abused. Uh, two, is that how you treat people that are sexually yeah. abused? Like you just what a re-traumatizing thing. Yeah, you just bark at them like you got you have to admit it, you know. And it was really, really inappropriate and uncomfortable. And just like, yep. why, why, why are you doing that? So, so now, having said that, I'm not a follower of Dr. Drew over the past 20 years. So maybe he's done a lot of really great things. I suspect that he has. Uh, but the coronavirus situation, he certainly. Uh, screwed that one because <laughs> he he was yeah. doubling down. I you know someone posted yeah. on YouTube this this mashup of all the things he was saying as the coronavirus was getting more intense. He kept changing what he said he said, and but he just I, I he, always he, said that it was worse than the flu, even though he never said that. Uh, he said like direct <laughs> opposite things, and it's really disappointing because it's okay to be wrong. It's it's okay to be wrong. You just have to admit that you're wrong. And he he waited so long, but eventually he did. Eventually he did apologize publicly. He did say he yeah. was wrong and he apologized. And I, I appreciate that. We certainly know of politicians and other people who would never apologize in any way, shape or form <laughs> for yes. what they have said when they innocently said something wrong. All of us were wrong. Berto, you and I, recorded an episode on health anxiety as the coronavirus yeah. was building in Wuhan. That's right. And I thought, well, we should talk about pandemic anxiety as we're talking about, because I'd been preparing for this episode on health anxiety for months, and it just happened to coincide with the coronavirus as it was developing in Wuhan. And, and at the time, uh, we must, which is hard to imagine, you and I must have had the mindset that It'll either never reach the United States 
or if it does, it's not going to do anything. Like that was because I had a whole section where we talked about pandemic anxiety, and our, both well, we, of our yeah. b- both of our conclusions, and this would have been recorded in January. I'm thinking was when yeah, it, when it was January. Okay, and and both of us were saying things like, well, you have to consider the likelihood of dying from things like this. And although it is more likely to die from this, the Wuhan virus seems to be 10 times, 20 times more likely to kill you than than the flu, the chance that you're gonna die from any infectious disease is still far below the chance of you dying from a coronary or a stroke or cancer or the, the things that kill people constantly all the time, every day. Now, I can't remember the exact uh, sentiment we had, but I guarantee you it was not in line with what was advisable in terms of putting out there. So, because I scheduled the uh, the uh, we recorded in January and then released it like in March or something. It was like a couple months later, and the night before I posted it, I was like, I think we talked about the coronavirus. I went back, listened to that section, was mortified at what you and I were saying, and cut the whole thing out. So we have this. Episode on health anxiety in March at the height of the coronavirus terror that we're still in, in which we never even mention the coronavirus. The reason why? Because everything you and I said would have been similar to how st- the stupidity of what Dr. Drew was saying. Now, at nowhere in the video or in the episode do, do I say, by the way, we're recording in January, so maybe think, oh, actually, I think I, we did kind of say did, that. You did. You, you specifically said... Maybe in two weeks, uh, we will all be sick and this will seem grossly blah, blah, blah. Like the other thing is that, um, granted, I didn't realize that it was no longer out there, but I would have stood by what I said mostly because you have specifically asked me right now, what is the risk that you will die from coronavirus? And at that time, I specifically said right now, I said, no, right now, of course, like I can, I can die from many other things, including the flu, blah, blah. Um, however, uh, yeah, like everyone was was looking the other way now i had ironically just that day or the day before posted um because i was listening to these videos this youtube channel uh that was tracking wuhan Uh, i think i even mentioned it in the podcast and i had posted to facebook because um uh someone someone that i know had been had made a post i also mentioned this in our podcast had made a post about uh the guy from star trek which again i a zulu right um, I've forgotten his name, and I asked you what was his name, and then uh, George Takai. Zu- George Takai, yeah, George it's, Takai. Had it's to- Sulu, not Zulu. Okay, Sulu. Sorry, uh, he had made a post saying, "If you're concerned about the coronavirus, you should really be worried about getting the flu shot." And then I had commented, and this was like the day before that we recorded. I had posted a link to these videos I was following, saying like, "No, it's not that. It's way worse," and blah blah blah. And I got into this huge debate with these people some of which are now debating people that I'm debating against because they finally saw that this was all true, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of hard to, to know how soon, if at all, uh, we were going to get hit hard. Uh, I don't think, I certainly had no idea that just a month later, the epicenter in the United States would be two blocks from where I live because that first life care center is two blocks from where I live. But um, still, yeah. Yeah, we had had previous events like this. Ebola was the most recent, and there was a lot of worry, and it amounted for Americans to be uh, unwarranted terror. So uh, there was just a lot of it was. It's just unprecedented, you know what's happened. Anyway, yeah. my my point is is that it's okay for Doctor Drew to have been wrong. Uh, it's just another thing to just continue to double down. But I do commend him for apologizing. Lately, I don't know if you podcast podcast listeners know this. Some of you might know this. Some of you might not. I've been posting these reaction videos to the uh, reality TV shows on the internet. The coronavirus has given me some extra time at home, and I've whenever I have extra time, I always think, okay, what could I do to kind of expand the podcast and experiment with different things, and. People have been asking that I watch these reality TV shows like Love is Blind and other kinds of things. And so I started making these reality, these reaction videos. And I've done other things like this before. I've made other kinds of videos on YouTube and gotten, 
you know, pretty lackluster response, you know, response from our core listeners. But on YouTube, there was always like about a thousand people on YouTube that would tune into our episodes, which is great. A thousand people. I mean, imagine a auditorium with a thousand people. That's amazing. Right. But on the YouTube scale, that's basically zero. You're basically treated on YouTube like you didn't even do anything, you know? And so, which is fine. You know, I, I was always okay with that. But I started doing these reaction videos and was getting numbers like 150,000 views and people wanting more and more. And suddenly now uh, I am this, you know, YouTube minor kind of element to the point where the people in the reality TV shows are now contacting me saying that they saw me talking about them. <laughs> and that's mortifying because I'm not talking in the way that I would think they would hear. Because when I had a thousand people watching on YouTube, the chance that they would come across it was pretty slim. Because, you know, right. we've we talked about OJ Simpson, we've talked about uh, Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> we've talked about all sorts of people. And I always just assume there's no way that those people are gonna hear this. We're, we're small potatoes, you know? And for these famous reality TV stars to to reach out to me and even uh, Instagram, how much they enjoy me talking about them <laughs> is <laughs> a bizarre experience for me. So I have started to wonder, is this, and it's starting to affect me psychologically in, in some not good ways. Mm. And uh, meaning that uh, one, uh, several things. One is, is that it's turning me into, uh, it's shifting my focus. So normally on the podcast, I focus on answering the patron emails, talking about clinical things, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, it's, it's tempting to become like a reality TV show person myself, mm, where right. that's all that I talk about, because there's this tremendous amount of attention that I'm getting from that. And so I started to wonder, is this what happened to Dr. Drew? In the beginning, he was this small little radio TV show. You could even call it like a right, radio TV show, radio show. You could even say it was like, it was like a little podcast of, you know, of a sorts from back then. It certainly would have lended itself to a podcast back in 1997. That format, that sort of long form, talky format. And uh, then he started to get more attention for these other things, like him commenting about famous people or him being on reality TV shows where he uh, tries to help people with addictions and him being interviewed about this and that, him talking about the coronavirus. He is not an epidemiologist as far as I can tell. So how he's an addiction specialist. How in the world does he have the expertise to comment about epidemiology and viruses. I, I don't know, maybe he did some right. special training on that, but he certainly didn't appear to have the expertise to say such things. So I've been worrying about myself, about is this how a, a Dr. Laura Schlesinger and the Tom Likases and the Dr. Drews and the Dr. Oz's for, for that matter, become a, uh, lose their integrity? Is this how it begins? Mm. And now, who knows? Maybe this is a flash in the pan, and in a couple of months, no one on YouTube will be interested in me talking about reality TV shows, and this will all kind of go back to our small little boutique podcasting experience. Who knows? But what if this even grows bigger? And you know, who knows what you know? Hap you know, with Doctor Drew, I'm sure there was a progression of uh, of activity that he ended up being asked to do, you know? Um, like right now, I'm getting a ton of emails from people. I Usually I wake up in the morning, I answer all the emails. Now I'm just talking about my fame, but, you know, I, I, I hope that it's for... I'm, this is all in the effort of trying to understand why Dr. Drew turned into someone that you and I would look at as someone who lost integrity that he used to have. Right, right. And and so like right now I'm getting all these emails, you know, and there's this and a lot of love, honestly. And you end up thinking because of all the love you're getting, you end up thinking that you can do anything. You could mm. say anything <laughs> because there's yeah. always going to be a group of people that are going to cheer you on because 
they like they you know they just like you and so they just agree with what you say and you know 5 years ago it was not the case there was hardly anyone who cheered us on 5 years ago you know right. 10 years ago and i couldn't just say whatever i wanted to and ex- and get anyone's approval and now it's different and so is this how a you know media clinician loses their credibility and i i really want to pay attention to that i always think about and this is grandiose but i always think about how and I don't know if this is historically accurate, but I know that it, it's under, understood to have happened potentially, which in the Roman times, the Roman Republican Empire, when they would do a, 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 uh, a parade, they would call it a, was it a tribute or, I can't remember what they called it, but it was a, a grand parade that was only given to certain people. And it was like the pinnacle of any Roman citizen's life to have, wow. to have this parade through Rome Julius Caesar, for example, had one of these uh, parades and- We're gonna throw you a parade. I've heard that phrase. Yeah, and all the crowds would show up and it was this grand worship of this individual who achieved so much for the Roman Republic and eventual empire. And the, uh, the person that's being honored was on a big chariot up high uh, and everyone's cheering, but and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but the idea was that you would have a slave standing next to you on the chariot. As everyone's cheering you, this person is is repeating into your ear, you are not a god. You are, oh. <laughs> you know, you are a human being. Yeah. You are not a god. You are not invincible. You are not going to live forever, you, you know. And this this constant voice that the the early republic of of Rome was very cognizant of of when you have a leader that believes they're a god, then that usually leads to tyranny, which the early Rome was really terrified of for for right. good reasons. And so they had this mechanism, and I always, and I go, I know that's grandiose, but I always think about that that as I get accolades, that I need to have a part of me that's like saying to me, "You are human." <laughs> You are no better than anyone else. Your opinions are no more important than anyone else's. You cannot fall in love with your ideas. You cannot believe that you are smarter than other people because you are a much better person and a much better communicator when you didn't believe in yourself as much as what this society is starting to make you feel like you should believe in yourself. Do you know what I mean? Oh, come on, Kirk. You can... You can believe that. Come on, <laughs> you, get you'd into be, the dark side. You'd be the other, the other person. Yeah, on, I'd be like, ch- "What's wrong? Like you, you've worked hard for this. You, you can have opinions, and yours are better than other people's. So don't let little, the little ones influence <laughs> you like that." <laughs> so getting back to Doctor Drew, now, I, I haven't, I, ha- I don't know the book that you're referring to, The Mirror Effect. So I can't comment on it. But so getting back to what he, you know, this anonymous listener was saying, the whole premise of the book is that examining celebrity narcissism like reality TV and how narcissistic behaviors get displayed in the media and then they get replicated or mirrored in viewers and eventually these narcissistic behaviors become normalized. So going on, you know, assuming that this summary is accurate, this, uh, yeah, it normalization of behavior is something that we should be critical about. We should look at that. And I think that there is some evidence, or or not evidence, I, I would speculate that some behaviors are becoming normalized in our society that should not, one of which is just lying. I, and I don't know if this has always been the case, but I find that w- people will say like, uh, I don't know, like there'll be a situation where you flirted with someone, you, f- you flirted with an old uh, girlfriend of yours or something, and you you ask for advice about, should I tell my spouse about that? Um, well, that's, I don't know, that's not a good example. Anyway, my point is, is that I don't have a good example of this, but I've seen the normalization of lying. Um, mm. Oh, like, like when someone is uh, like Bill Clinton, for example, yeah. when, when he did have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, but he lied about it, a lot of people were like, well, 
you know, he was in a he was in a tough spot. He should have lied about that. Now, I'm not going to go into the politics of that whole situation with Kenneth Starr and, you know, all his political ad- adversaries. But the point is, is that I'm seeing a lot of people normalize lying in a way that I find to be extremely problematic. Like oh, when totally. that like when that one uh, newscaster, uh, I can't remember his name, but he lied and said that he was in a helicopter that was hit by an RPG. Remember that guy? Yes. I can't remember his name, but he lied and said, yeah, I was in a, during the Iraq war, I was covering it as a news reporter and I was in a helicopter and we were hit by an RPG and we almost died. Well, he wasn't. The real story was he lands and he heard about another helicopter that had a RPG that was shot at it, but it didn't hit the helicopter. So over time, it drifted to... Now, there's been a lot of speculation or a lot of conceptualization of that, of like how memories are formed and how uh, memory isn't like a recording. And a lot of people are making excuses for him, which I think is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with teaching people about memory. But I have a hard time believing that if you really looked him in the eye and said, dude, I I really want you to think back. Are you sure that you were in a helicopter that was hit by, an, or whatever he said. Are you sure about that? If he dug deep, because it wasn't ancient history, it was just like 10 years prior, I'm sure he would have been like, well, maybe I wasn't in the helicopter. That, And of course, there's reason why one would drift towards that story, because it it aggrandizes his, his right. life, you know, just makes him look like a more badass reporter. So... I, and a lot of people who liked him were like, well, you know, sometimes you lie. And so, and I'm like, no, <laughs> sometimes you don't lie. Like, I don't lie, I, I, at least not knowingly. And I, integrity, people, like the things you say, try to make sure that you're not lying because it's not okay to lie. Your kindergarten teacher taught you that. It wasn't wrong that they were teaching you that. And for adults to kind of drift towards this gray zone uh, regarding very cut and dry situations, I think is, is problematic. Now, is that normalization of behavior that's coming from reality TV? I don't know, but something seems to be happening in that direction. Now, I could just be old man shaking fist to clouds, which is what I consider to be what Dr. Drew is saying. When older people say, oh, reality TV, it's ruining good American values, it's just, just a common thing. I mean, I'm highly suspicious of these kinds of things anyway. There's been claims of young people being more narcissistic since the beginning of time. In fact, in the old Roman times, 2,000 years ago, there were reports of the older Romans talking about how the younger Romans were more narcissistic. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like, it's weird to actually hear people's account of Julius Caesar when he was young, because he would wear his senatorial robe a little loose which was kind of sexy and he had <laughs> he had frills put on his on his robe that was that was like really girly Scandalous. yeah but it specifically it was kind of girly like julius oh, caesar okay. was coming across like a like a girly boy you know sex like a justin bieber kind of a thing <laughs> you know anyway um so uh whenever old white men talk about how young people are narcissistic these days I always kind of roll my eyes because it's like, well, where's the evidence? Okay, so let's talk about the evidence. And I'm sorry for dominating this this talk right here, Berto. But the summary of the research is this. Lots of news reports are stating that science has proven that young people are more more narcissistic today. I mean, have you seen such reports, Berto? Uh, that they're more narcissistic? Mm, yeah. I don't know. I, oh, there, I, may well, have, I may have heard it anecdotally, but I haven't necessarily seen it. But you certainly can. You can certainly imagine that there. I be, can imagine people saying that. Yeah, the fact is, is that we have research that we can actually depend on to answer this question, and there's a lot of research that does point in the direction of potentially younger people being more narcissistic today. But most of those studies looked at college students from a regular four-year university, which of mm. course is not representative of young people in general, particularly around the world. Also. Mm. The sort of people who, it, and, and the research in the 70s that we're comparing it to, the people who attended college in the 70s are completely different than the demographic of the general population and also completely <laughs> different from the demographic of the sort of people who attend college today. 
So right. they're not the same group of people. So you might just be measuring the narcissism of two different groups of people rather than uh, groups of people within different time zones. Also, the main meta-analysis by Twenge et al., which is often the one that everyone points to, and she actually is the one who often goes on news uh, channels to talk about how everyone's narcissistic today. Her, her meta-analysis excluded a bunch of studies that were counter to their conclusion for arbitrary reasons. It's like unknown why they did not include those studies in their meta-analysis. And that usually wow. points... Yeah, that usually points towards a researcher that has concluded something and then is cherry picking uh, for that reason. Other studies have found that narcissism rates have remained the same over the past number of decades. So which is true, hard to know. The other thing is, is that the, the studies that have found that kids are more narcissistic today, it's, it's based on this, me this measure called the narcissistic personality inventory, which is a, you know, a set of questions, things like, my opinions are better than other people's, true or false. You know, it's a narcissistic, right. if you said true, then it's a narcissistic notion. I am better than other people, true or false. Well, some of the questions on this inventory are more ambiguous, like, I like myself, or when I have something to say, it's worthy of saying. You know, those aren't the exact items, but when you hear, when you see those items, you're like, well, yeah, that could be narcissism, but also could just be good self-esteem, right? <laughs> yeah. And when you actually look item by item, the self-esteem items tend to be more higher and more endorsed these days than they were in the past. So is that an indication of narcissism or is it an indication of better self-esteem these days? And that's something that Twinge et al. doesn't report on. Mm. That's, so, a big, that's a big miss. Right. And... It stands to reason, we don't know, of course, because we don't have enough research, but that our parenting today over the past 20 years is better than it was in the 70s. Uh, it seems likely, given all the research and the opening up of different ideas about attachment parenting and all that kind of stuff, I imagine that parenting is a lot better. Plus, people have fewer kids these days, which makes it easier to take care of those kids and meet their needs and be attuned to them. Um, so it's possible that all this research pointing at this narcissism element is actually just pointing towards healthier kids that have <laughs> self that have self esteem the other thing here and here's the kicker is that their meta analysis they only found an increase among women they did not find an increase among men from the 70s and 80s Whoa. to today and no one's reporting on that huh so even though there's all these problems with the research to begin with even their own report only found an increase in quote unquote narcissism for women and not men. <laughs> and but they're but no, making it sound like a general. Yeah, they're making it sound like all young people are narcissistic wow. today when all they found was that <laughs> women had a higher narcissistic personality inventory score than you know today than they did in the past. And again, some of those items are just self-esteem related. So the fact is is that there's there's no evidence that I that's convincing to me and to any expert who looks at this sort of thing, of which many have, that people are more narcissistic today. So when Dr. Drew talks about how reality TV is normalizing narcissistic behaviors, that is just simply not uh, demonstrated in our in our in our outcome studies and our personality studies on actual humans. So what does that mean? It kind of looks like old man shakes fist at cloud who doesn't <laughs> like reality TV and doesn't like kids today. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the, the notion that, first of all, all the things you mentioned that they exclude, okay, that certainly is problematic. The specific one about women is extremely problematic because yeah, every single decade, every five years, women in this country have been able to feel better about their position in this country and have more opportunities. And it's still a battle. So like you rewind to the 70s, cer certainly a little better than the 50s, nowhere near where we're at now. So it is a other very interesting comparison. I wouldn't be shocked at all to discover that self-esteem has gone up for that group. Um, but that said, I, I wonder if in a narrower sense, and granted, the data's not there, the data's not there. I just think like if you compare a population of kids 
that watches uh, an amount of reality TV versus a population of kids that watches either none or much less, fewer, whatever. Uh, I do wonder if there's a difference between those. So not so much 70s versus now, but now versus now between watching and not watching. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the final word, Berto, on Dr. Drew, narcissism, social media, and conspiracy theories? Uh, well, I'm ready to watch some some uh, reality TV now because you've made it safe for me to do so. <laughs> no, I, I think if we could just look at the, the things that work best in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone we honestly care about, and we try to apply that more generally, I think we'd get very far along in this world. And what I mean is, when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone you genuinely care about, you tend to be more, you listen more, you tend to be a little bit more open, at least, you know, in general. And you don't tend to like immediately berate them or, or insult them or accuse them and all those kinds of things. When we watch reality TV, a lot of what we see is actually the opposite, right? Because that's not interesting. That's kind of boring. Like if you have a scene where it's like, oh, I, um, I didn't do the dishes last night like you asked me to. Oh, that's okay. I mean, we all are busy, but could you please do them tonight? It's like snooze fest. What you want is like, God damn it. Br dish is broken. That's the last time. Okay. And all those kinds of interactions, they do sell better. And then when you're a Dr. Drew and you start looking at the world and seeing what sells and what doesn't sell, and you start, you know, quote unquote, breaking dishes in your interactions with people, that does sell better. But it doesn't mean that that's how you would really honestly interact, let alone with a patient, right? Um, now, as far as like the, whether or not it has an actual effect, well, who knows? But I will say for me personally, I do think, I, I used to be very addicted to reality TV when reality TV went from, so like when, you know, when uh, the real world first came out, I really liked it. I actually still believe that that was a good show. But I got really addicted in the late 90s when it started becoming real garbage, like real meaty garbage. Um, and I do think it had a negative effect on me in several ways. For one thing, uh, just the, the pattern that like I had to keep up with like what was happening with all these various random people. And the fact that I did sort of long for more yelling and more drama. When I think back and I think about my own psychology and what I went through in therapy, that was reinforcing the things that felt like my parents fighting when I was little. And I, I don't think that was healthy. So for me personally, I, I, I think that a lot of reality TV is probably not the right, uh, that kind of reality TV uh, is not the right prescription. Well, what did, it, it, what did it do to you that was bad? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of, you know, as you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly like this thing led to that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that I do remember, first of all, being highly addicted to it. Like, well, I can't go to bed yet because I got to watch another one of these episodes. I, I, for one thing, I remember binging. Um, uh, there was one that was like pseudo reality. It was a MTV show. It was definitely not exactly a reality TV show because it was, it was a little scripted but it was trying to come off as a reality show and it was uh, called Undressed. And I remember binging, staying up all night watching those episodes because of the drama, because of like the, the, the fights and the things and the stuff. I remember watching all the Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire and then Joe Millionaire and then Joe Scumbag Millionaire, whatever the hell, all the millionaire shows and all that stuff. And, and like staying up extra late to do it and stuff. And, and the things that I felt like I was most attracted to were those kinds of negative human conflicts, which only years later I would come to discover were things that were re-triggering for me from my early childhood uh, experiences with my parents. So I can only imagine that that was causing me stress and lack of, uh, and, and then it had take, having effects in my relationships and probably in my ability to work better and all those kinds of things. Well, and were indications that you had healing left about those experiences growing yeah. up, right? Yeah, because yeah, exactly. Because this was in my twenties, and certainly I still had to. I I had a whole hell of a lot of healing ahead of me in those areas that I hadn't even, that I wasn't even aware of at the time. That's that's the problem. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, how about you out there? 
Why do you watch reality TV? What do you think of Dr. Drew? What do you think of narcissism? Comment below, email us, go to our website, psychologyinseattle.com, click the contact page, and you can fill out the form there. Just so you know, patrons get preference when it comes to emails. We're getting to that point because I get so many emails now that um, at some point in the near future, I'm guessing if things continue to trend in this direction, I might not even be able to get to all patron emails, which will really bum me out. So I don't know. I hope everyone can have some grace around that. Uh, but <laughs> at this point, I'm still reading all emails and responding to all of them. So uh, feel free to do that. Also, like I said, comment below on YouTube and participate in the conversation. And also, I'm guessing Birdo will eventually get his channel back up and running again. It's called Psycho Birdo, Psych Zero Birdo. So I have a concept. Yeah, definitely. So here, here's what I'm thinking. First of all, um, there's been a, a, a bevy of reasons why I haven't, but the number one is is busy, busy schedule. Um, I Building real fake dolls takes a lot of time. There's lots of meetings every day. It's, it's, it's a long story. But here's the thing. I have this concept where, and I don't know if it's the right way to do it, but I'm thinking... Because I, I was thinking about the several different things that I want to do, and I don't want to have like a whole bunch of different channels. So I was thinking more like uh, one one episode I would record about one thing, and that goes in one playlist. Then the next episode I record is on the uh, on the other topics, a different playlist. Because there's about three or four playlists that I imagine having running. You know, um, like one of them is about music. One of them is a, a continuing my '80s nostalgia thing that I started, which is basically the uh, several of the episodes that I made before were, were about that and about toys and, and things like that. Um, in fact, I have an episode that I had recorded in the can about cartoons in the 80s, but I wanted to intersperse like little snippets of those cartoons. And I, and like I never got around to it. So I'm thinking like I'm going to scrap that just like either record it without that or, or see if maybe the one I recorded already is fine without it. And, uh, and yeah, and then go from there. But. Well, people love you, Berto, so give the people what they want. Give them their... The one thing I'll never do is become some sort of like, you know, reality TV, like, sh you know, like commenter kind of... Because, you know, like that would just be like, who would do that? Like, who would do that, right? Yeah, I mean, just complete loss of integrity <laughs> and credibility. Watch me have like... I'm going to start doing that with the trashiest shows. <laughs> I mean... Uh, if you have an opinion, uh, people <laughs> might want to know it. <laughs> and everyone out there, your opinions matter too. And please take care of yourself uh, because you deserve it. Wait, hey, wait, Berto, how do we end this show? It's been so long since I've ended. You go like, uh, and please take care of yourself because, and then I go, God. Uh, how do we end this show again? <laughs> and then you go, oh, I think you say we deserve it. I'm like, we deserve it? So no, they deserve it. With all the coronavirus situation, <laughs> you no longer come to my house to record. No. Also, you and I have recorded fewer times, and I'm also doing all these other interviews with all these other people, and I'm doing all these things on YouTube, and I, I've I've gotten out of the rhythm. And when you just said it back to me, it's like, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, take care of yourself, and then you would say. Because you, you deserve say, it. No, no, you would say, take care of yourself because. Oh. And then, and then I go, you deserve it. I mean, <laughs> listeners out there are just like, Kirk, how could you possibly forget something <laughs> that you probably said literally 500 times, you know, prior? Yeah. Uh, all I right. I think more than that. <laughs> Everyone, please take care of yourself because. You deserve it. <laughs>